Coming up on Double Tap TV. We dive into the world of video games and find out what it takes to make a game accessible for everyone. The latest tech. I'm Alexa. I can answer your questions. Interviews. There will be several dozen shows trickling in over the months. Accessibility. We're, we're actually running a pilot scheme with the CNIB at the moment. This is Double Tap TV. Welcome to another edition of Double Tap TV. Thank you guys so much for being here. If you want to get involved on this week's show, email us, feedback at ami.ca. If you want to find us on Twitter, you can do that as well. It's at Double Tap Canada. And use the hashtag Ask Double Tap so we can find your tweets a bit later on in the show. I am Mark Aflalo. So happy to always be alongside Stephen Scott. Thanks for being here, Stephen. We've got a great show lined up for you guys this week. An accessibility specialist when it comes to gaming. He's coming up later on in the show. But before that, we want to welcome Mitchell Whitfield. Mitchell, you're now a familiar face here on Double Tap TV. Thank you for being here. There's a reason that you're here. It's because you've been a gamer most of your life. You now have a gaming show in Sirius XM. So, so welcome back to Double Tap TV. Tell us about your life in gaming. You know, first I thought you were having me back because you wanted to. Now I'm realizing you're having me back because you have to. But I'm, I'm still happy to be back either way. Don't get me wrong. I'm very happy to be with you guys again. Um, my, my, wow, wow. I, I, I'm sort of ashamed and proud at the same time to tell you I've been a gamer for well over 40 years since the first systems really came out, out of the arcades, into the home. I remember, I don't know if you guys remember this, Magnavox had the, one of the first home systems. It was their version of Pong, and it was a giant yellow console, and it was really three or four different versions of the same game, a giant paddle with a little ball, you know, Pong. And I thought this was the greatest cutting-edge technology I'd ever seen. Of course, we go to today, and it's ridiculous, but that was the beginning, and I, I kind of got into it then, and it never went away. I, I feel like Peter Pan. I really never did grow up. Um, when you think of gaming, Mitchell, and you think of our very own Stephen Scott, who we're going to bring in right now, I'm guessing you probably have similar questions to the ones that I have, which is, Stephen, how on earth do you game with your vision being the way it is? What console do you use? What makes it work or, or not work in your case? Well, it's an interesting one because for years I never really paid much attention to gaming. In fact, I'm going to be honest with you, I hate it. I think it's a complete waste of time. What are you doing with your lives, guys? Come on. Uh, but honestly, uh, it, is, it is a great experience for a lot of people, of course. And uh, there are lots of people who love gaming and some people spend far too much time doing it. But the thing is, for me, it was always the visual challenge, right? Playing those really popular games was was difficult. You know, I'd get one of the shoot 'em up games, and by the time I'd figured out who was shooting at me, I was dead. And that wasn't much fun. Uh, so I kind of moved away from that, and I tried driving games. I've always loved the idea of driving games. And um, that's because I can't drive, right? So obviously, it's the only chance I'm going to get to drive a vehicle, uh, legally, anyway. I have asked Mark for the keys of his car, but... He's never that keen. So uh, I decided <laughs> to try and uh, get into this. And when PlayStation brought out their virtual reality headset, I was kind of intrigued because I thought, right, OK, so there's PlayStation 4, there's a virtual reality headset. And what that allows me to do is, yes, of course, play lots of really interesting games in virtual reality. But you can also play those standard flat games, if you like, um, with you know the headset on which actually gives you about a 200-inch screen inches away from your face. So when you think about it, brilliant for people who've got low vision. Now, I was fortunate enough to be able to see some of it, so I was able to use some of it, at least up until a couple of years ago. But the, the reality was I did invest a few pounds, shall we say, a few of our little British pounds that are worthless now, obviously, thanks to Brexit, um, that uh, <laughs> I was able to go out and get myself a steering wheel, um, and the setup for it, I kind of went a bit crazy, if I'm honest. Mark, you know, you saw the, the setup. You know, Xbox, of course, came out with their adaptive controller, and I think that is a huge first step. Uh, it doesn't address everyone's needs. It's more, you know, it's not geared toward vision impaired, obviously, but it's geared toward being inclusive, getting people that can't play games traditionally and bringing them into the fold. The next step, now that we have you know better access to the game, I think the next seismic shift is gonna happen when at a core level, we start making the games themselves more accessible at a programming level. You know, making the building things into the games, building accessibility, baking it in on the, at the developmental level, which is gonna be a huge shift. Oh, I absolutely think so. And you actually give me a perfect segue because coming up, we're gonna be talking to 
the author of the Game Accessibility Guide. That's how I found him. His name is Ian Hamilton. He hosts two conferences every year, one in the US and one in the UK, that are designed to actually educate game developers on what they need to know and what they need to do to start thinking of accessibility from the get-go. So let's take a quick break. Thank you, Mitchell Whitfield, for being here on this week's show. Stephen Scott, stick around. We're going to take that break and come back and speak to Ian Hamilton. If you guys want to get involved, it's feedback at AMI.ca. On Twitter, it is at DoubleTapCanada. Use that hashtag, AskDoubleTap. And when we come back, we'll talk to Ian Hamilton. Love Double Tap TV? Listen to AMI-audio for Double Tap Canada every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern for news and reviews on everything tech. is Double Tap TV. We are back on Double Tap TV. I am Marco Flalo. Thank you guys for being here. Before we get to our next guest and before I bring Stephen back on, I want to remind you guys, if you want to get involved, we've got a great email address for you. It's feedback at ami.ca. And on Twitter, if you want to get in touch, it's at Double Tap Canada. And use the hashtag AskDoubleTap. So Stephen, we're talking about accessibility, but from a very cool angle this week, and that is gaming. Quite honestly, I don't think it's ever been a topic that I thought we'd get into when we started this show. Are you feeling the same? Where are you actually? You're like looking at me like, Mark, you're crazy. Of course, we're going to be talking about gaming. No, I am actually with you on this one. I'll be honest, this is an area which I've often found a little bit of a challenge, and I've, I've thought as my sights got worse. Is this like an area I could ever really enjoy? I mean, I, I love driving games, for example, and uh, what I tend to do is drive very slowly. Uh, so as not to hit anyone. Uh, I'm talking here about Grand Theft Auto, of course. Uh, and, uh, you know, I love uh, driving the, the, the car around or the bus around or whatever it is I like to do. Uh, yes, I like driving buses. Get over it. Um, and, you know, it, it's great fun. But, you know, I, I don't really get as a huge amount of enjoyment out of the, the shoot 'em up stuff because usually by the time I figured out who's shooting at me, I'm dead. So, you know, it's never great. And I don't know how an experience like that could be made accessible. Well, so let's actually bring on our next guest because I think we might get an answer to that question or at least some right direction, proper direction. Ian Hamilton is an accessibility specialist. He is based in the UK, kind of not too far from you. Uh, Ian, welcome to Double Tap TV. Thank you for being here. I'm, I'm happy that you're on with us because I was doing some research and I was looking for games and accessibility and I landed upon your website, which is the Game Accessibility Guidelines. But before we even get into that, can you tell us how you got into this field and, you know, before we even lead up to the guidelines? Um, yeah, so it was, it was kind of a multi-step thing. Um, the, 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 first, the first thing for me really was um, way back in the mists of time of, I think it's about 2000, 2006, something like that, um, I was working on um, kids' games for the BBC, so things like Teletubbies and Bob the Builder and that kind of stuff. And I hadn't been there for very long when I saw some playtesting footage of games that had been adapted um, for use using a single um, accessibility switch. Um, and when I was a um, kid myself at school, we had an exchange program with a special education school. and. I'd seen kids with this kind of level of um, motor impairment who were basically just lying at the back of the classroom as passive participants um, in their school environment. And then seeing through this post-testing footage of um, what was really quite a trivial design thing um, of how the controls have been um, modified. These same kids I was seeing now um, laughing, smiling, playing, um, doing exactly the same thing as um, all their classmates were doing and just being equal participants in their society. So um, that, that's the kind of thing that you can't unsee, you know. Now, the thing is, Ian, of course, the number of people who watch this program will have multiple disabilities or various disabilities. Let's home in on one particular disability, and that is blindness, because that is ultimately uh, where we aim our program, at people who are blind or partially sighted. How do you make a game like, for example, Call of Duty or Grand Theft Auto or those kind of games that that are you know, hugely popular to, to the mainstream audience. How do you make that accessible to that particular market? Is it doable? Um, Grand Theft Auto is actually um, really popular with people who have no vision at all. Um, really? Basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you play um, Grand Theft Auto um, 5 in first person mode, um, so that your character is always facing in the same direction as the camera, um, that means just through 3D sound, um, you can hear where pedestrians are walking and you can hear where cars are driving. That tells you where the edge of the pavement or edge of the sidewalk, sorry, is going to be, which is where cars are parked. 
the way you get into a car is just to press the button when you're near to one. You don't need to accurately line up where the door is. So that means you jump into a car. You can happily drive down the pavement, mow down load of pedestrians. Then you hear some police sirens. Jump out. You've been there before, right? Um, jump out. I'm yes. police shouting at you. You know roughly where the police are. And how shooting works in Grand Theft Auto is um, you point roughly in the direction and press the lock on button and it automatically aims straight at them. So it's already got a couple of assists in there that um, combines with the good sound design and the, um, the uh, 3D sound in the game. I think that's important for developers to see because if you speak to a developer who hasn't really thought about a topic before, they're like, blind people playing games, like the video games, you know, video. Um, but if you, can yeah. actually show, if you can actually show somebody, show a developer, actually, look, this certain percentage of your game is actually accessible, then, uh, like, the consoles start turning, lights like, start flashing on, they'll be like, oh, if I just tweak that little thing there, then maybe they might be able to play, like, 30% or 20%, and then maybe for a tinker this thing over here, you know? So that's kind of what's happening at the moment. I think it's a, quite an interesting stage where more than there has ever been before, like these big companies are actually taking a real strong interest in accessibility to blind gamers, which is something that hasn't really happened to any kind of degree before. So it's quite exciting times. Um, that combined with, um, there's basically a, leg um, a legislative reason now why games that have communications functionality um, must ensure that certain areas of their interface are blind accessible, which means integrating screen before. So we're actually seeing now big AAA games which have screen media accessible menus, which again is something we haven't seen before. So so those kind of things coming together, I think hopefully it's not going to be too long until we see one of those big block of the games, which gives a fully equitable experience to sighted and blind people. You know, I remember a while back when uh, Black Ops 2 came out and Borderlands 2 and SimCity, they were got a lot of press because they actually considered things like uh, color blindness consideration. Are there any other games more recently that have kind of been front and center in the spotlight because of their advocacy for accessibility in games or, or their efforts? Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the real big one was Uncharted 4, which came out in 2016 on PlayStation 4. And that not only had the wide range, wide range of accessibility functionality, they did a really, really good job of shouting about it. Um, so lots of PR effort. They had like a long video with like interviews with people who are benefiting from it, interviews with the developers and talking about what they've done. And we're also seeing the rise in accessibility within consoles as well. For example, the Xbox One, uh, the Sony PlayStation building in accessibility. And I'm talking here about screen readers, uh, you know, Xbox benefiting from the narrator screen reader in there. You know, so we're starting to even to see the, the consoles themselves become accessible. Uh, that it marks a change and, and it certainly gives us hope as blind people that we will be able to enjoy these games, which of course are a big part of our social fabric, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. That's it. Culture, recreation, socialising, these are insignificant things to be um, allowed or denied access to, right? Part of it is, um, like I said, a legislative um, push because consoles have communications functionality as well, so that's kind of helped drive it. But it's been nice to see um, all of them continuing to run with it, like beyond what's the minimum required for compliance and carrying on to the nice stuff. Ian, you know, we talk about companies like Microsoft, like Google, uh, very often on this show. And when we talk about accessibility with anybody of those companies, it, we really do see that DNA, the accessibility is in their DNA. It's in their fabric. It's from, from day one. It's not about how do we add this afterwards. It's how do we get this going and make this accessible for everybody, which is it, it's taken some time to get to that point, especially with these large companies. Do you ever see a day where that kind of approach is there with game development? developers from the start? We're starting to, like I said, th this, this year was, we're going to be starting to see a few of those games that have actually been properly thinking about it from the start. I'm talking about like the big name AAA end of the industry. There's plenty of other people down there, like the small indie developers who've been doing an amazing job of this stuff for a long time, but it's really about, about big budget, big name games that the big shift is happening. But it's interesting as well seeing the influence of those companies, um, in particular um, Google, who've got their own gaming platform um, coming out, Stadia, that recently came out actually. And they've announced that they're actually going to be working towards mandatory accessibility requirements across all of their games on the platform, um, which is something that no one in the, in the games industry has really kind of um, had the nerve to do before. So 
I think even just the fact that they've announced they're doing that, that's going to change, I think, the dialogue um, at those other companies. It's interesting, Ian. I'm wearing right now a pair of Bose AR frames. These are the audio glasses from Bose, and I wear them all the time. I wear sunglasses all the time, so why not wear high-tech ones, eh? But interestingly, it's, it's interesting to see how audio games are starting to come out as well. So uh, what about that field? Have you any experience in that? I know it's very popular among blind people, these audio-only games. How do you think we could get those into the mainstream? Um, I think it's, it's, it's a bit tricky with the audio games themselves going into the mainstream um, because sighted people often need something to latch on. So even if it's some kind of like token visuals, um, mm. but it's, I think the, the main outlet for those is platforms like Alexa, where it's designed entirely around an audio only experience is what people are expecting anyway. I think that the biggest value that audio games have is that there's been a ton of really, really, really cool, innovative stuff been going on for, for decades in the audio games field. So some of those, and it's like, the, like we were just talking about with how do you make a game like Call of Duty, how do you make a game like Grand Theft Auto accessible? Look at audio games. They've already figured out all those design problems. So it'd be yeah. so, so nice to see some of those big companies looking at these audio games, which often are designed and developed by blind people, actually looking at those games and taking some of those lessons and, and applying them to, to the bigger mainstream games as well. Well, I'm going to start wearing a pair of headphones uh, when I'm playing Grand Theft Auto from now on. I want to try this 3D soundscape. Mark, I'm going to have even more fun driving my bus. Yeah. Can you imagine? I actually want to see your actual bus in action. Uh, Ian Hamilton, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Let's keep in touch because there's so much more we can talk about down the road. And it was a pleasure having you on Double Tap TV. That is Ian Hamilton, the author of the Game Accessibility Guide. We'll post links to him on all our social media if you guys want to get involved. Again, feedback at ami.ca. And, of course, on Twitter is at DoubleTapCanada. And use that hashtag, AskDoubleTap. When we come back, we're going to dive more into that Xbox adaptive controller with Mitchell Whitfield and Stephen Scott. It is Double Tap TV. Stick around. Love Double Tap TV? Listen to AMI-audio for Double Tap Canada every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern for news and reviews on everything tech. is Double Tap TV. We are back on Double Tap TV. Thank you guys for being here this week, joined by Mitchell Whitfield and Stephen Scott. You know, guys, one of the things we did not really talk too much about was Microsoft's adaptive controller. And for those who aren't aware, Microsoft designed a controller for the Xbox that gamers are loving. Uh, most are calling it their favorite controller. Unfortunately, for those with limited mobility, the controller is not really the best for them. So in the Microsoft promo video here that we're showing on the screen, you can see an example of John, who has cerebral palsy on his right side of his body. And while he can use his left hand no problem, his right hand lacks the dexterity. So here's a perfect example of someone who the adaptive controller was made for, because you can plug it in and then plug in different adaptive adaptive devices, people can game with one hand, with one foot, or one hand in their shoulder, or even one hand and even their chin, Stephen. It's a really, really cool piece of hardware that other companies are now even getting on board with. Logitech has an actual kit that actually has different switches that you can plug into it. A very, very cool device and a very, very cool example of exactly what Mitchell was talking about earlier in the show, of how they're really innovating at Microsoft. It's not just a, a cash grab here. They're really creating something that's cool that meets the needs of people with disabilities. Yeah, and we're seeing that across the board at Microsoft. Everything they're doing has accessibility at the heart of it. But there's an interesting side issue here. I say issue, that's the wrong word, but, but essentially what's happened is in the world of phones and in the world of computers, uh, blind people were actually almost first in the line when it came to accessibility, right? Uh, and that's not a good thing or a bad thing. It's just the way it turned out. Uh, iPhones became very accessible and then Android followed. Computers are far more accessible with built-in accessibility. Uh, with vision issues at the top of the list at, in every single occasion. And certainly the most amount of work going towards uh, vision-related accessibility, which is brilliant. Interestingly, though, on the gaming front, that doesn't seem to have happened. But what I am pleased to see is that we are getting this uh, um, huge amount of accessible tech, uh, well, and primarily the Xbox Adaptive Controller, which is helping people with uh, multiple disabilities play games. I just hope that blind people aren't forgotten about because the idea is, as you two both said just at the top of the show, how does a blind person play a game? <clears throat> you know you know what, Stephen? I think, again, this goes toward... It wasn't that long ago when people were talking about television programming. How do we reach all audiences? How do we create programming for everyone? Let's make television more accessible to different 
to different audiences. So when it comes to gaming and we're talking about different disabilities, whether it's limited vision, blindness, yes, you're right, that has not been addressed well enough. But I think, again, if we go to the programming level, if we go to the people that are developing these games, what, what about focusing more on games that don't require acute vision or, uh, you know, twitch reflex, you know, visual you know, interaction with the game as much as, you know, being able to hear stories being told, much like a, an interactive movie. Games that involve more your thoughts, your hearing, yes, some vision if you have limited vision, but games that don't necessarily rely on looking, seeing, fast reflex, or like you said, Call of Duty, something that people love, but if you can't see the game, you can't experience the game. And it's also about making those games mainstream, isn't it? Because it's not just about blind people wanting to play, so therefore let's create a subsection of gaming that's just for blind people. Right. I, I don't want that. I want games that you can enjoy as well. And one, for example, that's coming out this year is Pitch Black. And that whole game is going to be an audio-only experience. You're going to be using 3D sound uh, to be able to navigate around this world. That is the kind of game I want to play, uh, but I want everybody to enjoy. And thankfully, that game is coming out as a mainstream offer. That's really key, because the only way we ever get true accessibility is when it's across the board, when mainstream is able to use it as well. Otherwise, it becomes specialist, it becomes expensive, and it isn't cared for in the same way. So I am hopeful for the future of this. I'm seeing a lot more audio-based gaming. I mean, I'm wearing the, the Bose AR frames right now. This would be ideal for 3D gaming. So, you know, and that is something that's being looked into already. So, you know, the more we can do this, the better the experience we can all have with gaming. Uh, I, I'm, I'm quite excited about the future of this, actually. No, I am too. Yeah. You know, Stephen, when you uh, think back to using the VR headset on the Sony PlayStation, um, did you suffer from any of the issues that other people who didn't have vision loss suffered from in terms of the nausea, in terms of any of the dizziness, or was it something that really wasn't even an issue for you? It wasn't a major issue. Uh, the only reason I gave up on it, quite frankly, was because the, the vision just wasn't good enough anymore to even to see at that distance. Um, but yeah, it, it was, it was, I never had any of those issues. No, and I know people that have. Uh, and of course, there's the issue of 3D. Those people who have only one eye or one functioning eye, um, that can have real issues because you don't get the 3D experience. Uh, so yeah, there are lots and lots of issues in here, uh, which I guess the developers have got to really think about. Audio is perhaps the answer. And you know what, Mark, this also goes back to, I know we're limited on time, I just want to put this in here. We, we talked about on other shows together, you know, what we'd like to see in terms of our controllers. And yes, I understood why Microsoft's Kinect did not catch on with everyone. But as I said from the beginning, the one thing that was important to me about Kinect was the microphone, being able to interact with my games verbally. Now for me, it was more about, you know, Xbox, take a picture, take a video, blah, blah. But for people, again, that use their voice as a form of control, having that microphone baked into the system in some other way, now that the Kinect has been discontinued and not supported, I'd love to see a microphone built into the Xbox controller so people can use their voice for control. Now you, so, I mean, this is the kind of thing that I think, you know, Stephen we, and I are talking about. This would be baked in accessibility, using voice, and being able to, for these games that are telling stories in different ways. Well, we've got new consoles coming up in just a couple months before a holiday time. We've got a new PS4 coming out. Sorry, a new PlayStation coming out, a new Xbox coming out. So maybe some of these wishes can be granted. Guys, thank you so much for being here this week. I want to thank Ian Hamilton, of course. Uh, very cool conferences that he puts on for game accessibility. We're going to follow up with him throughout the year and see what kind of developments have come from there. On behalf of Mitchell Whitfield and Stephen Scott, I am Mark Aflalo. Thank you guys for being here. If you want to get involved, it's feedback at ami.ca and on Twitter at Double Tap Canada with the hashtag AskDoubleTap. Thank you guys for being here. We'll speak to you again next week. For more great Double Tap TV content, visit ami.ca slash Double Tap. Hosted by Mark Aflalo and Stephen Scott. Contributor, Mitchell Whitfield. Editing, Will Attar. Integrated Describe Video Specialist, Ron Rickford. Coordinating Producer, Jennifer Johnson. Director Production, Karen Nye. Director Programming, Brian Perdue. VP Programming and Production, John Melville. President and CEO, David Arrington. Copyright 2020, Accessible Media, Inc.